Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Hope for Healthcare with Dr. Katie Cole. Dr. Katie Cole is a holistic physician, organizational well-being consultant, and change agent, working with industry leaders and proven strategies to heal our national healthcare system and our culture of medicine. Stay tuned to hear today's speaker. Welcome everyone to Hope for Healthcare. This is a podcast in which we interview expert leaders around the country on best practices for healing our national healthcare system and our culture of medicine. I want to extend a very warm welcome today to my colleague, Dr. Andrew McLean. Dr. McLean is clinical professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and associate dean for wellness at UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences. He has received the American Psychiatric Association Bruno Lima Award for Outstanding Contributions to Disaster Psychiatry, and he has been conferred with numerous Teaching Excellence Awards, as well as Distinguished Alumnus Recognition. Dr. McLean previously was the Medical Director of the North Dakota Department of Human Services. He has served on numerous clinical, administrative, and regulatory boards, including medical licensing and professional health programs. He has lectured internationally on pertinent behavioral and public health issues. Dr. McLean has an interest in collaborative models of care, as well as individual and community resilience. I am so excited to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much, Dr. McLean, for being with us today. Thanks, Dr. Cole. Yeah. Well, you know, in our previous discussion, you know, you've mentioned that you're really passionate about, you know, promoting well-being for your own students, medical residents, and faculty. Can you tell us a little bit more about your passion and, and what you've been doing with your healthcare system? Sure. Um, so my background is I, I grew up in the family of a country doc and where my mom was a, a nurse and my dad was a country physician. And so I grew up, you know, going out on house calls with them and scrubbing for surgery and all the things you can't do nowadays. But I also, you know, I, I, I had a real um, appreciation for not only the um, the dedication and commitment to a community, but also that it's not just one person. There's, you know, the whole family was actually part of that. And uh, it, one of the reasons I decided not to become a country doc was I also saw the toll that it took on my dad, leaving the house at two in the morning and missing supper every fourth night and things like that. And so, um, you know, I, I grew up with both the appreciation, but the understanding of the cost that it took. Um, particularly when people are more isolated. And so um, as I went through my medical school program and, and residency and, and began practice, I, I, I got involved in you know, supervising um, you know, practitioners and also uh, became involved in our state medical licensing board. I was on that board, also was um, the chair of our professional health program board, which essentially was the impaired physicians board. And so you know, uh, in in working with colleagues, but also trainees, we know that if if we see issues very early on and nip those in the bud and give people support, um, it it helps not only them but also the burden to society and patients. If we ignore that or or watch people kind of smolder along and struggle, um, they're the ones who end up getting in trouble and then causing problems also with their patients. And so. You know, I, I I recognize that we really have an obligation to step in and assist people, not only for the good of our profession, but also for those individuals and also our patients. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think you you definitely hit the mark when you said that you know you can catch things early on, and I think providing these skills necessary for self care, advocacy, even some leadership training in the beginning can make a very, very big difference in somebody's career mm-hmm. um, and really help them be successful in their current environment. So, right. Yeah, and it, it's not a surprise. Most recently, uh, the Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has talked about you know, isolation as being a public health um, crisis. And certainly I've seen that in practice over the years with colleagues that uh, the many times the ones who get into trouble um, with their practice and personal lives are those who don't have the opportunity to have support among colleagues, bounce things off of um, their colleagues. We all have questions about practice or different stresses in our professional and personal lives and and having people to bounce that off of makes a huge difference. And so, um, you know, I think we were seeing this certainly post our, our pre-pandemic 
uh, with more isolation. But uh, the pandemic certainly isolated many of us more. And, um, and, and we've certainly seen numbers continue to climb in terms of uh, people feeling isolated in terms of, um, you know, younger generations in particular um, uh, feeling more stressed. Well, how do you address, you know, isolation at UND School of Medicine? So what we've been doing, we actually have um, a lot of inter interprofessional interactions with our trainees. So not only amongst themselves, but also with their colleagues in PT, OT, um, you know, physician's assistants. Um, and so they learn early on that it takes a village and, and within their practice and care for patients. It's typically not just them, or um, if they feel it's just them, they know that there are people that uh, they can reach out to and refer patients to and get assistance with. And so that's been a big part of it is just the interprofessional training. Also, one of the first things that I did, I've been uh, chair of the Department of Psychiatry for about eight years and more recently was appointed the Associate Dean for Wellness. One of the first things I did though was I, um, I hired a, a, a medical student uh, advocate um, essentially a wellness advocate for students, residents, et cetera, um, so that they had an identified person that they could touch base with um, if they were having stresses. We, we specifically set this up not to be a therapist, but to be someone who they could bounce things off of and, and not to over pathologize, you know, the stress that comes with, with medical school, but then to also be able to have someone who can screen and refer on to higher levels of care if needed. So mm -hmm. we've, we've since then added another individual um, to help in another part of the state. Our, our state is very rural and our medical school is such that we have um, the first year and a half or so basic sciences training at one campus and then they go out to one of the other four campuses or even more rural. And so we wanna make sure that as they move out into those other clinical areas, that they still have individuals that are identified that they can reach out to, and that can also reach out to them to make sure that they're not um, struggling or isolated. Wow, that's that's amazing. I'm so glad to hear that you are addressing uh, wellness and well-being at the early stages, even in medical school and health science training. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And I like that you mentioned that your wellness director is not a therapist. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> can you go a little bit more into detail about and the role that the wellness director plays? Sure, sure. So um, what what they do, and 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 one of them in particular in in the basic science years. So she will have, uh, she'll do training on, on resilience and meditation. She actually is a certified yoga instructor. Um, at times of, you know, pre-exam, she will, um, you know, uh, coordinate to have um, therapy dogs come by and just reduce the stress as they, they're going into their, uh, their exams. Um, she's identified as helping people um, to navigate the mental health system if they need to. Um, she will answer the phone any time of day. She will uh, assist uh, um, the, the students or others in getting the care that they need. Um, and, and she is really recognized by the students as someone who is extremely supportive to the point that she's been recognized with a number of awards um, you know, for, for having done so. I just had a conversation yesterday with one of my colleagues kind of praising um, that individual about how, you know how integral she is within the medical students' uh, experience. And is she? And you mentioned that she also has a role of triaging and being able mm -hmm. to refer. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so every we we actually have with our medical school, we do the um, the well being index for medical students, which came out of Mayo initially. And so we actually proactively will screen and it's, you know, anonymously, but we will, we will see, uh, we have our fingers on the pulse of how our students are doing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll watch and see if there are any particular trends. Um, we also have uh, anonymous links for students to reach out um, if they have concerns. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we take really a proactive stance of uh, trying to be preventative and trying to uh, make sure that if we see anyone who is struggling, whether it's a class as a whole or particular individuals, that we then reach out to them and uh, remind them uh, that they have uh, the opportunity to, to visit with our, our wellness advocates. And so that's been very successful. 
That's great. And then do you do you also offer do you have any kind of mental health treatment as well available for your students? Right. So we have the the university has the counseling center, which is campus wide. And then they also have the uh, the ability uh, to actually have the the medical students um, set up uh, appointments virtually. And so, um, you know, if they're on a rotation out in the western part of the state and they need follow up, they're able to actually set that up. Uh, virtually. And so there's really continuity of care. Another thing that we've done, uh, which is, I think, somewhat unique with our professional health program, which initially initially was set up for, you know, physicians and also physicians assistants, those who are licensed in the state of North Dakota have what's called a professional health program. And it's similar to other safe harbor type programs. So you can either self-refer and if you do so, then you don't have to check on your medical licensing application that you have any issues with substance use or, or mental health issues, et cetera, if you're actually already getting care for that. That most PHPs, though, professional health programs also um, have mandated referrals for people who have <laughs> been identified, uh, you know, clinicians who are identified as having difficulty, and then they're mandated to follow through. We actually have afforded that for our medical students as well. So they can self-refer to the professional health program, even though they're not licensed, but they are afforded the same um, resources as our physicians are. Oh, that's wonderful. Is there, like, sometimes there can be a little bit of stigma, though, around the um, the PHPs. How do you exactly. address that with your students? How do you, how do you address that? Right. Well, we do education, um, you know, on the on those opportunities. Um, the student affairs office has a close relationship with the PHP, and then um, the like I'd mentioned with the wellness advocate. They during orientation, they again reiterate the resources and opportunities that are there uh, for those students. Um, and so, you know, I think that it it helps them to understand that this can be a lifelong issue, a lifelong process. And uh, again, nipping problems in the bud early um, reduces a lot of burden to everyone going forward. Absolutely. Um, what are some of the other projects that have been your top priority as Dean, Associate Dean of Wellness? Um, so since um, having been appointed, and it's been actually less than a year, but we've developed a, a, um, a well-being task force within our medical school. And our medical school is, is mentioned more than medical students, it's faculty and students from occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, medical lab sciences, um, and, and um, uh, sports medicine, et cetera. And um, so all of those um, groups, um, you know, we, we get together, there, there's representation not only with uh, faculty, but also student membership. And so we're, we're looking at um, essentially doing a, a, an evaluation of uh, where is our current culture of well-being mm -hmm. and particular areas. So what we've done is we've, we've categorized it under um, culture, learning, and also environment and benefits. And so within those areas, what are things that we can do um, to, uh, to enhance and make our, our, uh, our, our culture even um, you know, more, more one of belonging and, and healthy. And so we're in the midst of refining that right now. And we have, you know, six month plan, 18 month plan, um, you know, a five year plan. This interestingly dovetails with the university as a whole, which has a str uh, strategic plan for um, leading in particular pillars. And one of those pillars is actually affinity and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And mm -hmm. so this actually dovetails nicely. Also, my role, as I've seen it, is not only with our medical school per se, but I've always said that universities have an obligation to the community at, whole, at large and, and regionally. And so part of what I also want to do is to look at what other healthcare organizations are doing for wellness for their providers, because 75% of our practitioners in our state are also volunteer faculty um, and, you know, they may not be salaried by the medical school, uh, but they clearly, you know, uh, are, are teaching our students, they have their own stressors, and um, many of them belong to uh, a, a number of different healthcare organizations. So part of what I want to do, too, is coordinate with those healthcare organizations as to what all are you doing for wellness for your providers? 
um, and not to reinvent, reinvent the wheel, but if there are gaps, how can we assist them in, in filling those gaps to make all of our uh, providers healthier? Well, I mean, I think I think that's great that you developed a wellness task force. I mean, that's one of the things that even the Surgeon General talks about and the, the National Academy of Medicine report is encouraging all organizations to have, and it's a good starting point. And mm -hmm. I love that it is dove dovetailing along with your mission and vision mm -hmm. with the healthcare system or in the state as well. So I think, I think that's really important that you're linking everything together and that you're also evaluating the program. I think that's mm -hmm. the key too. So you can right. actually your own internal results. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, oftentimes we we fail at, at at figuring out first what the issue is, or even asking those who are affected, you know, what they need, what they prefer, and kind of go in blindly and start just charging through. And so I, I think we're being very intentional about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, with our, our our school, as I mentioned, there there are many other individuals besides um, medical students, and we even have research in biomedical sciences. And so, uh, when we have campuses elsewhere, one of the things I've been very cognizant of is. It, it's very easy to um, to focus on just one particular campus or one particular population. And we oftentimes forget, you know, who we're ignoring, you know, who we're not bringing into the circle. And so um, I think representation across the board is, is really, really important. We also, in our medical school, we have, um, I think it's the only, it was certainly the first uh, PhD in indigenous health. And so we have also we've had a program since I was a medical student of uh, called Indians into Medicine, where a certain number of slots within our medical school um, are dedicated towards uh, individuals of American Indian or Alaska Native populations. And so um, we're also very mindful of um, you know different cultures and different um, populations that may have different needs uh, than we may think going out you know shooting out the box. So again representation has been really important. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious, how have your students and residents found some of that resilience training to be when they actually get on rotations and they're dealing with the stress of healthcare day to day in the culture? How have you had any feedback yet and how they're managing that better than they would have without the training or any wisdom, words of wisdom you have for other uh, physician leaders out there who are trying to create a task force? We, we do have follow-up, um, and, and again, I think one of the advantages of adding a, another wellness advocate, uh, particularly out in um, the western part of the state, has been that continuity and, and continuing to touch base. Um, and so in, in terms of data, we are actually looking more mindfully at some of the, the surveys that are being done. When I came on board as wellness, uh, the Associate Dean for Wellness, you know, I became aware that some of uh, some of the students and and faculty have been surveyed, but we weren't necessarily looking at and tracking, you know, the 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 data on that and and utilizing it to to uh, to move things forward. And so we're in the process now of of doing a deeper dive into that analysis. Um, but uh, you know, certainly um, anecdotally, um, that's it's been. Uh, seen as as positive. There's also something unique with uh, medical schools. At the end of graduation, for all medical students in the U.S., there's something called the the GQ, um, which is the graduate questionnaire that comes out, and they ask questions retrospectively um, on your experience as a medical student. And so some of the some of the questions also have to do with you know support within the medical school and you know how you know, how was that for you and are there areas uh, that can be improved? And so it, we recently had a survey this past year, the, the LCME um, Liaison Committee on Medical Education uh, came in, did a survey. And so all medical schools that are accredited, they track very carefully what the student response is, particularly within that graduating GQ. And, and so then we refine you know, areas that, you know, may be, um, you know, needed for improvement. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, one of the areas that you've talked about as well that you've been working on is your telehealth mm -hmm. education. Can you go into a little bit of that? Because that's, you know, that's becoming, you know, more popular now, especially for, I think, quality of life for healthcare practitioners too. Yeah. And 
and then mm-hmm. be able to reach, you know, um, <clears throat> remote populations of patients. So yeah. I'd love to hear more about your program and what you're doing with that. Yeah, absolutely. As you can imagine, um, in our rather frontier state, you know, access is is difficult. We all know that, um, you know, recruiting people into mental health has been has, has been a challenge. Um, in our state also, we, you know, in, in, in addition to the vast distances, we also have blizzards. We also have things that happen that disrupt, you know, one's typical clinical mm-hmm. appointment times. And so for many years, uh, when I was with the Department of Human Services, we had developed uh, telemedicine to help to meet that need. And, and now in our residency program, we do um, intentional training for our residents um, in both telehealth, but also in visiting those sites in person. You know, I think it's 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 wonderful. Telehealth brings a, a lot, I think, to the patient experience, uh, particularly those who, you know, you don't want to take time off to travel a great distance. Or like I said, you may just dis- be disrupted by, you know, weather or something else that occurs. And and so we meet a lot of needs by by telemedicine, but it's it's not exactly the same as being in person. And it's interesting during COVID. Um, you know, I think a lot of healthcare organizations were challenged as to how to shift to, you know, telemedicine. We were doing that previously for a long time. And so both for psychiatry, it's, I think it's an easier shift, but also for, you know, our, our area, it was, it was easier as well. So for our residency training program, what we do is, is we have six residents per year. And in the third and fourth years, uh, we we have them do telemedicine a half a day per week to particular sites out in different parts of the state. And then one day a, a month, we ask them to go out to those sites. And so they're able to see the clinic, see the staff, see the patients, you know, get a feel and be part of the community, as opposed to being a doc in the box who really doesn't understand the culture, the setting, the resources that are there. And so I think we do a really nice job of, of training our residents well into how to utilize uh, telemedicine. And so it's been very well received and, and we've gotten certainly good feedback on that. And I would say about half of the residents that we graduate go on to practice in our state or in our region and so they're well aware of the issues, the culture, the resources, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's great that you're training your students <clears throat> and residents in telehealth and telemedicine. And, you know, there is an art to it. And mm-hmm. especially because I'm a psychiatrist and I've practiced telehealth on and on yep. for 15 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do think that when you are able to go in person, even one day a month or, you know, even if you sh- if you're out of town or something mm-hmm. and you're meeting, but it does make a difference to be part of that community. And I think there are ways to really help patients feel like they're being cared for and to have that, you know, to build a rapport effectively. Um, mm-hmm. It just takes a little bit more effort in a, mm-hmm. and I think in a different way when you're on right. telehealth. Yeah. But I think that's wonderful that you're doing that. And mm-hmm. I know a lot of doctors are switching over to a hybrid practice too, where they're doing some mm-hmm. telehealth and it's making a difference in quality of life too. Yep. Um, and they're getting, you know, it's less administrative burden too when you're doing telehealth. So I think Absolutely. that might be one of the solutions for burnout in healthcare. Right. And, uh, you know, I think in terms of, you know, protective factors against burnout is, you know, having some control over your schedule and your your daily practice. And I think um, telehealth certainly affords that. Um, we another opportunity that's that's come about because of how we're doing our training is it gives those communities the opportunity to meet prospective you know recruits and so we've had a number of our residents who have chosen um, to stay in those parts of the state uh, because of their experience in going out there and so that's been uh, certainly a plus. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. McLean, are there any other? Um, aspects to what you're doing as Dean of Wellness that you want to discuss today with our audience? Yeah, I, I think one of the areas um, that I think is important that we've we worked on in terms of um, you know, physician wellness or, or provider wellness um, is reducing um, the barriers in people getting help. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have, we, we are what we would call, you know, safety sensitive, uh, you know, practitioners, not unlike airline pilots or others that are in, you know, specialized areas where it's really important that the public knows that that we have safe individuals providing that sort of service. At the same time, you know, I think for many years, we disincentivized providers in getting help because they had to check a box that said 
they had some issue mm -hmm. or, you know, they had to report. And so I, some of the work that we've done um, when I was with our state licensing or what the professional health programs, or even when I did work for the Joint Commission, um, is when we would visit with healthcare organizations and looking at their privileging documents, you know, do you ask unnecessary questions that really have nothing to do with safety of, of patients um, that would cause people to not want to check that box? Um, I certainly have had colleagues who had refused to go in and get help because they didn't want to have to check somewhere that they were actually receiving treatment. And so, you know, I think we've we've been moving uh, in the right direction, both with healthcare organizations looking at those documents for privilege and credentialing, as well as state licensing boards, you know, looking at their uh, licensing application materials to see, you know, what is it that's really required um, to maintain safety for patients and get rid of uh, questions that are really stigmatizing and don't really have much to do with patient safety. In addition, uh, as I mentioned, those safe harbor opportunities, if there are professional health programs where people, uh, providers can get engaged with assistance and don't then have to check the box that, you know, they have some issue with mental health or substance use, um, that's definitely a plus as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm really grateful that you're working on that. I know a lot of states are, are working on changing over the credentialing process and mm -hmm. the Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation, of course, has a toolkit on their website and um, yeah, Corey yeah. Feist is, the CEO is always happy to to um, mentor others in, in trying to adopt that for the state and yeah. um, medical board credentialing. So absolutely, uh, that's wonderful to hear. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, is there any, are there any last words of wisdom that you want to leave with our audience today before we wrap up? Um, you know, I, I, first of all, I, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to just visit with you, um, Dr. Cole. I, you know, I think um, the, the medical profession, the healthcare professions, you know, we have an obligation to provide excellent and safe service, uh, but we also have an obligation to take care of ourselves, um, which then helps everyone. And so I think we just continue to move forward um, in ways that reduce barriers um, for providers getting the help that they need, recognizing um, it's an occupational hazard. It's, it's stressful. And then also, you know, training our um, students, our early career practitioners um, in making sure that they're aware, self-aware of what their needs are and that we've reduced barriers for them to be able to reach out for help and that we stay connected and, and help them to not be, not be isolated. I think that's the key for a healthy uh, community. I, I couldn't agree more. And we definitely need each other and we need a standard for what we consider to be professional working environments mm -hmm. and nurturing and thriving working environments. Mm -hmm. So the more that we come together and we have training in that, I think that really does make a difference because then we can shift our culture. Yeah. And I think the last thing I'll mention, Dr. Cole, is that, you know, um, I've been through numerous uh, generations. My father was a doctor. I'm a doc. My son's a doc. Um, but, you know, the, the, the Gen Z and the millennial uh, generations and others, they're kind of teaching us that uh, we need to focus more on that. And um, I, I, I think that they're not, um, you know, willing to jump through some of the hoops that we all felt that we were supposed to and needed to jump through. And I think that they're helping to change the landscape as well in terms of self-care. Absolutely. And I'm, as much as we gripe about the millennials, I think that it's, <laughs> we all do it, but I think it's also important. They're bringing a different aspect and mm -hmm. perspective uh, to the working environment. And I think if we can be open-minded and embrace some of those really good ideas and, and mold that into our standard of you know, professional work ethic and culture, I think it really does make a difference and it's more inclusive. So, Absolutely. and there are future generations. So why not yep. build a healthier foundation of healthcare that takes into account our future? I, so. I tell people, you know, as I get closer to retirement that I'm, I, I'm actually uh, very content and gratified and knowing that we've trained our, our next generation well. And I also joke with people, my primary care doc is, is young enough to be my daughter. And it just doesn't seem right, but that's the way it is. And so, um, yeah, we, we need to uh, hand over a healthy culture to the next generation. I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you for your part, Dr. McLean, in, in helping us change our culture 
in America. And thank you for your wisdom and your dedication and your commitment and for your time today to being on the podcast. Thanks for the visit. All right. right. And everyone, if you have any questions um, about what we've discussed today, of course, I'll have Dr. McLean's information on the website and we'll be posting all the links as well and and, um, articles that he's written. So um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to him and I'll also post his contact information. All right. Thanks for tuning in today, everyone. Take care.